Hey everyone, it's January 17th, 2019. We took a few weeks off. We're coming back to chapter three of Human Action. And uh, the chapter is Economics and the Revolt Against Reason. It's just Brandon and me here today. Um, Stephen's away, but he'll be joining us again. Um, we're going through the Robert P. Murphy study guide at the request of Brandon here, which I think has been a great idea. It's been yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, I really like this book. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, I like it too. And um, it's, it was tough to get through without this study guide, and this is helping a lot. Right. Um, I listen, so actually this is the first chapter I didn't read. I listened to it twice on audiobook. Nice. Uh, I did that too. Use Audible? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. I, I had some long car rides, so... Perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought this chapter was pretty straightforward. Um, as it was not as technical as the last chapter. Yeah, he seemed to be saying, like, <clears throat> before I get to my argument, let me dismantle any um, arguments that you're going to have why my arguments are invalid. Right. He was just saying, like, can't argue with what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, he doesn't make his points quite yet, it seems. He's just sort of uh, addressing criticism before it happens. Because mm -hmm. I guess his points would be invalid if he didn't. You know, or people could just say, oh, it's, it's junk. Yeah, it anyway. felt like there's a lot of history in this um, chapter. Yeah, so should we go through it? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll start. The... So, section one, the revolt against reason. What does Mises mean by saying, the revolt against reason was directed against another target? It did not aim at the natural science, but at economics. Well, I would say he's probably talking about how the um, Marxists with polylogism were saying that, oh, the bourgeois and the, the capitalists, they invented these economic theories because it benefits them, um, not necessarily because it's true. Their minds are clouded, and so it was like a, an attack on economics, not the natural sciences, per se. Right, and then because they had this thought on economics, they didn't just stop there. They they went on to the natural sciences because of that line of thinking that takes you there. Yeah, like one false belief yeah. begets another. Mm -hmm. um, all right, why is human reason constitutionally unfitted to find truth, according to Marx? Why is human reason constitutionally unfitted to find truth, according to Marx? So, I guess, what is human reason? It, what have we defined it so far? It's praxeology, right? Um, praxeology, I think, is the study of human action. Mm -hmm. I think human reason is um, logic uh, itself. It's what separates us from animals. Right. Yeah. Human, human reason. reason. Yeah, not acting on instinct. Right. Um, having a reason for our actions uh, is like fundamental to the human condition. Right. Um, so I think the Marx's main point is there are some people that are just born to a class, so their mind is in some different state than others, so their reason doesn't necessarily apply to someone else's reason. It's really ridiculous because it almost seems like there would be just like a million truths. There's no truth. It's just, you know, if you're born into the bourgeois, there's the truth for you, and mm -hmm. if you're born to the, um, I don't know what the other class is called. Polylogism. The, the, like, class of people, the, the working class. Yeah. Um, then you have a, a different truth, and human reason can't find the truth. It's just however, whatever you're born into, and yeah. whatever your race is, and all that. What is the bourgeois? I just assume it's like the upper 
class. The bourgeoisie. Yeah. Um, is the upper class. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's probably a better definition for that word, which might help. Bourgeoisie, up uh, the middle class. Okay. Mm. Um, typically with reference to its perceived materialistic values or conventional attitudes. Um, in Marxist context, it's the capitalist class who own most of society's wealth and means of production, which would kind of make sense in both contexts because they're talking about the working class being like the low class and mm -hmm. with industrialization and capitalism, the bourgeoisie was like a new class of wealthy people who are the, the middle class right. finally get out of that nonsense. While you're looking something up, you should look up the polylogus. Polylogus? Well, I take apart, the, <coughs> I, while I was reading, I took apart the two words, polylogus, yeah. so many logics. Oh, okay. I assume that, I don't know, we'll see what it is. I did not look it up, but. Polylogism is the belief that different groups of people reason in fundamentally different ways. Mm -hmm. The term is attributed to Ludwig von Mises, who claimed that it is that it described Marxism and other social philosophies. So, the logical aspect of polylogism. Give examples of some of Mises' more serious objections to the concepts of social class and race as applied by the polylogists. Give examples mm -hmm. of some of Mises' more serious objections to the concepts of social class and race. Um, well, I would say the example that um, Marx and Engels themselves were not from the working class. They were from the upper class, so how could they possibly have the working class thought, the, the logic of the worker, right. if they're not from that? That would seem to like dismantle their entire argument just by the virtue of the fact that they're not from the class mm -hmm. that they think that... Anyway, there's that, and also there's mixed race people which if races have certain ways of thinking, then mixed race people. Right, there's so many different ways you can divide people. It's like, if you keep doing that, then you get down to an individual. Yeah, well, right, yeah, <laughs> not only that, and then he also brought up the Nazis, how there are Germans who don't think like a German. It's like... Who decides Yeah. what a German thinks of? So I would think those are probably some examples of the more serious objections. I don't know if, he, if that's in quotes, so maybe it's a there's a specific part that he's talking about, but that's what I would say. Yeah, I think that covers it. So the praxeology aspect of polylogism. Why is the ideological approach erroneous from the praxeological point of view? Marxists use the term ideology to denote a doctrine that is faulty, but which nevertheless serves the interests of a particular class. Such a stance is untenable, though, for how could it ever be in a class's interest to believe false ideas? So I would say that's probably yeah, the answer there. Is I think so. Uh, how is it erroneous from a pra praxeological point of view? Because even if you have an ideology that um, believes false ideas, then you'll you'll die out because you can't deal with reality. You won't yeah. live long enough to procreate your uh, cultures. And I think also it's the fact that praxeology um, deals with an individual's decision, and this ideology. Uh. Is it's formed for 
class. Good point. Yeah, that's then you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So like, a class doesn't have any value judgments, but the individual does. Yeah. So right. Good point. Ideology. So I like the distinction here too that um, Murphy makes. Marxists use the term ideology to denote a doctrine that is faulty by, uh, according to using the correct proletarian logic. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's not proletarian logic, I guess if it's proletarian logic, then it's just logic. But if it's so anything what's else, it's ideology. What's proletarian logic? Proletariat would be, I think, in opposition to the bourgeois or mm. bourgeoisie, the okay. um, proletariat, meaning the, the lower classes, I'm pretty sure. Oh, see. okay. Proletariat means workers or working class people regarded collectively, mm -hmm. often used with reference to Marxism, or the lowest class of citizens in ancient Rome. That was an old word. Why is the psychological background of its creators not important for the examination of a theory? So I think the, in the book, what made the most sense to me is like when you look at math theories, like Pythagoras theorem. Nobody cares what Pythagoras thought of what his ideas were. It only matters whether a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Yeah, or whatever his motives were for yeah. coming up with it. It's either true or not. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. How does workers' competition among themselves relate to Marx's theory of the interests of the working class? Oh, yeah. This was cool. Um, so Marx's theories would say that everyone would be better off if they institute a minimum wage, for example, um, but that does not benefit the people who lose their jobs because they can't produce enough value to be hired to, because of the minimum wage. So like, right. some people get fired if you institute Marx's ideas, so that's not I mean, there's workers. There's always competition among workers themselves for the labor, mm -hmm. which is limited. And so, which benefits some people versus others? Yeah. Yeah. Comment. It is ideas that make history, not history that makes ideas. Hmm. Yeah, he did say that, but... Um, so I guess he's saying it's not that we, I don't know, develop ideas from what has happened in the past, but we develop ideas and then they affect reality. Racial polylogism. Why is Marxian polylogism irreconcilable with science and reason? So, it's just for the simple fact that Marxism relies on an ideology that someone says is right and you're incapable of proving me wrong because I'm bestowed the special ability of thinking the way I think and you're just incapable of thinking that way because of the way you're born. Yeah, it's so anti-scientific. Mm -hmm. Like, science like, is all about reproducibility and, you know. Yeah, I think they talked about Hitler in this 
section where, yeah, you, like, he needed a test to t see if you're pure German. Right. And it was up. It but was who makes the test to be pure German? Like, Hitler wasn't even fair-haired and blue eyes. Right. But he just bestowed upon him the ability to develop <laughs> this program. Yeah. If you followed it, you're really German. Yeah, the test was like, if you do what we want, then you're really German. <laughs> and if you don't like it, then you're not really German. And it's like, that's not how it's supposed to be. It's like, you're supposed to all think the same way. If, if Marxian polylogism is true, then all Germans would think the same way. But they don't. Do different races have different logical structures of mind? Say they haven't found anything yet. So probably not. From a biological and structure point of view. Hmm. Yeah, they, he made some he made some comment about this. Ah, right. That um there are differences among the races and in their ways of thinking, like Gandhi, mm -hmm. but Gandhi gave that all up when he needed to <laughs> use a Western hospital, was like, all right, forget my ideas, I need to be treated. Right. So, no, they probably don't have a different logical structures of mind. They, we can all conceive the same things, um, despite differences among the races. Has anyone ever documented the different logical structures of the minds of people from different races? Mises asserts no. This book was read, <laughs> written 60 years ago, 70 years ago, but I think it's probably safe. I haven't found anything or heard anything. Yeah, um, there would probably be some sort of insert if yeah. there had been a change in that. Uh, yeah. And it's, I think, been, I think it was studied, he, he references some sort of studies that had been done, and I know what Charles Darwin and Dalton and all the people who study differences in genetics had been around for, I guess, about a century when he wrote it. Um, polylogism and understanding what determines judgments of value and the choice of ends. What determines judgments of value and the choice of ends? Is it the individual's preferences? That's a guess. I don't really remember. Yeah, I don't remember this section that well, so I'm looking in the um, study guide. Ah, a much milder version of polylogism simply asserts that various classes or races share similar value judgments and historical understanding. Yet, even this weaker claim ignores the heterogeneity within classes and races. It also repeats the polylogist's mistake of thinking that it can ever be beneficial to hold an erroneous judgment. So the question was, what determines judgments of value and the choice of ends? That didn't really quite answer it, did it? I'd say the individual. Yeah, it's gotta be. That's always, that's, yeah. It's the all individual preferences, I guess, that they're looking for down. Right, so it can't be a group of people mm -hmm. determining judgments of value. I guess it is, it's always an individual who determines, you can look at an aggregate of their judgments of value, but it's still always an individual who makes that determination. And who originally said, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs? I don't know that. That's a famous guy. He was uh, part of the French Revolution, but his name escapes me at the moment. 
Um, starts with an R. Because he, he was talking about, um, the aristocracy and how they can just, um, hurt the, the peasants. It is hard to achieve something important without causing unpleasant effects. Yeah, we get that that's the yeah. concept of it. Um, but the answer to the question should know this. Robespierre. There we go. Maximilian Robespierre. Okay. Before Stalin, during the French Revolution, it was Maximilian Robespierre in 1790. And, um, since they ask, um, we should probably give some information about him. Maximilien Francois Marie Isidore de Robespierre was a French lawyer and politician, as well as one of the best known and most influential figures associated with the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. I think he ha he met a very bad end, if I recall correctly. Um, downfall. He defended himself against charges of dictatorship and tyranny, and then proceeded to warn of conspiracy against the Republic, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, he was executed. And I think, if I recall, in a particularly gruesome way. <laughs> nice. Um, Yeah. Uh, when clearing Robespierre's neck, Charles Henry Sanson tore off the bandage that was holding his shattered jaw in place, causing Robespierre to produce an agonized <coughs> scream until the fall of the blade silenced him. Oh my god. According uh, to the executioner's son, it all happened very carefully, but Robespierre roared like a tiger. Um, the applause lasted 15 minutes later. Um, they were buried in a common grave at the newly opened uh, Amaranthus Cemetery. Yeah. Cool. 
So how about that? Yeah, not cool. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I don't know if he was good or bad, but that's pretty nasty. Um, the case for reason. Can we study a science of irrationality? So, no, and it's because reason is an axiom, I guess, or rationality is an axiom, um, as in there's not an irrational mode of thinking. So you can't think irrationally. We certainly couldn't study it. If it was irrational, it would have unpredictable results all the time, and there would be no point in studying it. Right. Fortunately, I don't think it does. What drives many intellectuals towards socialism? Free stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. He did mention this. What, what exactly did he say about it? Yeah, there can be no such thing as a rational mode of thinking. To renounce reason and return to guidance by instinct would destroy the foundations of civilization. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, I mean, the, I mean, this is another book. It, the socialist utopia sounds like it could be a good idea, but in practice, it would never work. Like, if everything like, could be put in the pot equally, and it, it just, it doesn't work, and it, I, I can see the utopian thing that socialists aspire towards, but I don't think it's a good idea, or it's possible. What do you think is the answer? What drives many intellectuals towards socialism? Is it just the free stuff? No, I think it's because it's... Whenever someone says they believe in socialism, or it's like, I could do that. Like, I could make socialism work. So as an in, it's an intellectual ego. Like, mm. if I was in control, I'd, make sh I'd be the best dictator. I would be fair. Uh-huh. So... If you're an intellectual, like, it, I think it's the ego of saying, I can do it right. Socialism in Venezuela and all those other countries don't work because they didn't do it right. Right. I can do it the right way. Ah, uh, so it's, um, it's tempting. Right. It's an ego. Mm hmm Saying, I can charge to that utopia. Right. And it's also the... the it presupposes that humans have more power than they really do with regard to like moving people around like a chessboard. Mm -hmm. Like, oh well, if if I had all this power, I could just move people around and make them do what I want, and then mm -hmm. everyone would be fair and equal and nice. But like, it's presupposing too much. Mm -hmm. um, can we demonstrate the validity of the a priori foundations of logic? I'm going to have to look up a priori again. I think that's where it's um, from its own definition. It's like axiomatic a priori, meaning like... Um, okay, so it's uh, relating to or derived by reasoning from self-evident propositions. Right. How can we demonstrate the validity? Can you? Can we demonstrate the validity of the a priori foundations of logic? Well, I would think so, just by 
um, a logical proof. You just proof, boom, 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 put things oh. in order. So reason is an ultimate given, a non-rational fact. Mm -hmm. One cannot establish the validity of reason itself through logical argument. So I right. think that implies that we can. Well, that answers the first question. Right. But is there more? Can we demonstrate? You probably give some kind of example we can demonstrate. I wish I had the book with me. Oh, you don't have the book with you, didn't I, you? I just I grabbed the study guide. Oh. Yeah. Normally I bring the book, but. Um, yeah, I don't have it with me either. Hmm. We'll, well, we'll leave that one unanswered for now. Yeah, I mean, I think we can demonstrate it. I'm not sure how because of the sentence. Reason is an ultimate given, a non-rational fact. One cannot establish the validity of reason itself through logical argument. So I think if you, if you state that, then I think the opposite would be you can demonstrate. <clears throat> Here's something in the technical notes section. Mises affirms Hoppe's interpretation regarding synthetic a priori truths, though not in these terms, when he writes, quote, it is consequently incorrect to assert that a prioristic insight and pure reasoning do not convey any information about reality and the structure of the universe. This is kind of like a double negative, but I think he's saying that it is correct to assert that a prioristic insight and pure reasoning do convey some information about reality and the structure of the universe. Okay. Can we demonstrate it? Yeah. Um, I guess like every time we apl apply s something um, a prioristic, like an unmarried bachelor, um, like every time we point out a bachelor unmarried, yes, by definition that's the case. Um, right. So we can demonstrate the validity of the a prioristic, or the a priori foundations of logic because the things that we derive from them are true and are provably true. So the more we do that, the more we have like a 100% consistency rate. Uh, that, that to me would demonstrate the validity of the foundations, the prioristic or a priori foundations of logic. Well, those were the six sections of chapter three Next is chapter four, the first analysis of the category of action. So it looks like we'll finally get into like action. Yeah, cool.